I'm in a place that for millennia has been dedicated to love. Welcome to Walks of Italy, I'm Jason Spieler and today is March 15th. It was on this day in 44 BC that the gentleman beside me met his end. Of course, I'm speaking of the most famous Roman of all time, Gaius Julius Caesar. When you hear Caesar's name, what connotations come to mind? Perhaps soldier, statesman, hero, villain? Some of you may have even thought of salad, but that's altogether a different story. As you can see by the flowers, the wreath, even a handwritten letter addressed to Caesar in classical Latin, his name and memory are as alive today as they were during his own lifetime. Join me as we walk together in Caesar's sandals, visiting the actual historical locations of that fateful day of deceit and murder when Caesar breathed his last. The night before Caesar's murder, we know that he went to dine at the house of a friend named Marcus Lepidus. Over the course of the dinner, Caesar was distracted with his daily correspondence when suddenly the conversation of the guests turned to the question, what could be the best death that a person could desire? Though distracted, Caesar was the first to respond, an unexpected one. Later that night, he returned home, presumably to his house here inside the Roman Forum. When Caesar was in his mid-thirties, he was elected as Pontifex Maximus, a high priest position which gave him the privilege to live here, just off of the Via Sacra, adjacent to the house of the Vestal Virgins. We can imagine Caesar coming down this very road and then turning to come inside his home. While Caesar is asleep in his home, he is awakened by his wife who is tossing and turning as she's having nightmares of holding her dead husband in her arms. The next morning, Calpurnia begs Caesar to please stay home, and her suspicions are confirmed by the priest, who predict unfavorable omens for Caesar that very day. He's convinced. He asks Mark Antony to go to the Senate on his behalf and let them know that he's too ill to meet them. When the conspirators receive word of this, they become very anxious because they know in only three days' time, Caesar is going to leave Rome on another military expedition and will probably not return for several years. Therefore, they send a conspirator to Caesar's home, who happened also to be his close friend, to convince him that it would be too great of an offense for him not to come in to receive the honor that the Senate was to give him. Therefore, Caesar dresses himself he makes his way through the Roman Forum on the way to that fateful meeting. On Caesar's way to the Senate, he encounters a soothsayer that he had met before, who had warned him to beware the Ides of March. On this very day, he runs into the same soothsayer again. He says, ha, the Ides have come. The response was, they're not over yet. Behind me is the Aria Sacra, the sacred area of Latigo, Argentina. The columns that you see belong to temples that were built more than 2,100 years ago, even before the birth of Caesar himself. In other words, these are the same temples, the same columns that Caesar saw that last hour of his life. Accompanied by Mark Antony, he was heading to where the Senate was meeting, which was the theater house of Pompey the Great. The entrance to the theater was just behind these temples, right where that tree is. However, a group of senators approached Antony, telling him they had an important matter to discuss and pulled him away. Then unaccompanied and all alone, Caesar headed to his destiny. We are now standing inside the theater of Pompey the Great. Its semicircular exterior wall you can see in the curvature behind me. As in many places in the historic center, it's possible to trace the outlines of the ancient city as its ruins are incorporated into the fabric of the modern city itself. So yes, people are actually living inside the theater and parking their cars and scooters here. While we don't know precisely where Caesar was murdered, we know that it couldn't have been too far from here. After the Senate meeting commenced, Caesar was suddenly attacked by the conspirators who withdrew their concealed daggers. Caesar began to fight back when it said he turns and he sees Brutus, whom he loved it like a son. And shocked by the betrayal, he says something to the effect of, et tu Brute? 
and you, my son? He throws his bloody toga over his head. He falls to his death, having been stabbed 23 times. Though Caesar's mortal story ends there, his legend was just about to begin. You can imagine the panic that gripped the city of Rome immediately following Caesar's assassination. Mark Antony, no longer sure of his position, arranges to meet Brutus and the other conspirators, and they strike a deal. He agrees that they will not be prosecuted for the murder of Caesar in exchange for Caesar receiving funeral rites, which eventually take place here, inside the heart of the city, the Roman Forum. Behind me, there is a restored piece of a rostra, and it was on a speaking platform such as this that Antony would have stood, looked down upon the body of Caesar placed on an ivory couch, and hanging over the body was a wax effigy of Caesar with 23 bloody stab wounds in the statue. This is where Antony delivers the speech immortalized by Shakespeare that begins, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him, but of course is exactly what Antony does. He reminds the Roman people of all that Caesar has done for them, of the money that he's brought into the city, of the honors that he's refused, and then to conclude his speech, he unrolls Caesar's actual will, whereby the people discover Caesar not only donated land, but a bit of money to each and every Roman citizen. The people go crazy. They take their leader, they pick him up, and they carry him in this direction. Caesar's body is carried down into this part of the Roman Forum, and part of the crowds begin scavenging the temples and basilicas, collecting any wood they can find, and construct a funeral pyre for Caesar here, right in the center of the Roman Forum. This, of course, was unplanned. The fire rages on and even damages some of the buildings, but as Caesar's body is going up into flames, people are surrounding it, coming to pay their respects with women throwing jewelry into the flames with Caesar. It's for this reason, in this area, a temple to the god Caesar was constructed some years after his death. Caesar, the first Roman citizen to be made into a god. You can still see a portion of the foundation of the temple behind me, and a piece of the altar still exists, which has traditionally been held to belong to Julius Caesar himself. We can imagine sacrifices being offered to the god Caesar, and still today, people go and pay their respects and leave flowers at the spot where Caesar went up into the heavens. I as well will go pay my respects to this daunting figure. Wow, imagine someone leaving you all these flowers more than 2,000 years after your death. Just as offerings were left here at the altar of Caesar in ancient times, so you can see it's still happening today. Caesar's renown is still so great, there's even a group of Romans who reenact his assassination this afternoon. We'll conclude these Ides of March with their performance.